Okay, this is the second part of the lecture on Japanese ethics. In this part, I'd like to talk about the following five things. First, I'd like to talk about Watsuji, just to give you an introduction to his works and also uh, Watsuji as a thinker from 20th century Japan. In the second part, we will dig into the, his conception of ethics. So how he conceived of Japanese ethics as Rinrigaku. Now, sometimes it's very difficult to talk about ethics without paying attention to the concrete examples. So when you talk about ethical theories, it's always important to think whether or not it applies to our conception or experience of reality. But what is more difficult about studying non-Western philosophy, for instance, is to think about the examples that are not in your cultural background because the theory comes from different cultural backgrounds. If we think about the examples, it's very difficult for us to see whether that example is culturally sensitive, right? So it's important to see movies or documentaries from that culture to contextualize everyday experience in relation to that culture. So to alleviate this problem, I'd like to introduce some works of Japanese filmmaker. His name is Koreda Hirokazu. So in the third section, I would like to talk about Koreda movies. And then in the fourth section, we will talk about the notion of family, how the family is portrayed in the works of Koreda movies, and how is that philosophy of family emerges from his works, and how it's related to Watsujin ethics. And then final part, we will visit some concluding questions. Now, if you are watching this video as students of ethics at the University of Antwerp, it's very likely that I'll go over the limit, time limit. So what I recommend here is for you to watch the first two sections on Watsuji and Rinrigaku, and then jump straight to the final part of concluding questions. But if you're interested in Japanese ethics and how it's portrayed in Japanese every day, I highly recommend you to go over the third and fourth section as well. Okay, on that note, I'd like to start this second part with Watsuji. Watsuji Tetsuro is a Japanese philosopher for 20th century Japan, and this is how he looks. So you can see how he is dressed in traditional Japanese kimono from the early 20th century Japan. He's considered to be a part of the famous school called the Kyoto School of Philosophy, and I'm a specialist of Kyoto School of Philosophy, but you have to put an asterisk to this description because Yes, he was a part of the Kyoto school, but he also moved to Tokyo and became a part of a Tokyo school. So he's, he's a kind of thinker that have worked both for the Kyoto school and a group of intellectuals that are based in Tokyo. And in the previous lecture, you saw where Tokyo is, right? Watsuji Tetsuro is easier to think of him as a Japanese philosopher from last century. So that's the best way to deal with him. But you can also see the conceptual influence from the Kyoto school to his works, as we will see later. The Kyoto School of Philosophy consists of famous thinkers like Nishida, Tanabe, Nishitani, etc. And Watsuji worked with Tanabe and Nishitani was uh, actually a student of Watsuji at one point. So you can see the mutual influence between uh, Watsujians and Kyoto School philosophers. Watsuji is most famous for Watsujian ethics. So Rinrigaku was his expertise. He was also known as the first scholar in Japan to study Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. So he was also a specialist of Heidegger and hermeneutics. As you can see from the text of Rinrigaku, Watsuji takes hermeneutics as a basic methodology for working on this notion of ethics. A famous episode says that the Watsuji wanted to write a PhD dissertation on Nietzsche, but he was, it was rejected and instead he worked on something else. But anyway, he's known for this study of existentialist thought, including Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, and Heidegger. Now, Watsuji's Rinrigaku is from volume 10 and volume 11 of the complete works of Watsuji Tetsuro. Now, complete works of anybody from Japanese philosophy is often called Zenshu. So, Watsuji Tetsuro Zenshu, that's the abbreviation WTZ, is the complete works of Watsuji. Now, complete works of Watsuji looks like this. There are 20, how many volumes? Like 24. Nine, uh, 25 volumes with the two additional volumes. So 27 volumes of complete works of Watsuji. And volume 10 and 11 is his text on ethics. So this is how the complete works of Watsuji looks from the other side. Uh, as you can see, they didn't spend much time making this aesthetically appealing. But you can see how massive he works as a whole. 
And then what's this in ethics or the this text on ethics is a very small fraction of the whole work. And this is another picture of Watsuji, and I really like this picture because it demonstrates his uh, a kind of rapport or appreciation of nature, right? So he's in the garden with his kimono, but you can see he's looking at nature with interesting, you know, it's it's, it's interesting to see how philosopher is actually observing the nature. Okay, so what is the rindi or rindigaku of Watsuji? And this is where you actually spend most of the time from the reading assignment. Uh, I'm pretty sure you didn't spend more than 10 minutes for reading the Heart Sutra, right? Now, we dig into what he's trying to do with the notion of ethics or Rindigaku in this section. He starts with the Rindigaku with the critique of modern subject. He criticizes that the modern European philosophy often describes human subject with individual consciousness. Or sometimes we talk about human subject as rational being or mindful being. So if you read modern philosophy, oftentimes human subject is either conceived as individual consciousness, as you can see in Descartes, or you can see some modern philosophers associating human subject with reason or mind, like Kant and Hegel, or German idealism. Now, this conception of subject, Watsuji says that is problematic because it's placed over against the object, that is nature. So subject is existing over here as rational individual, either individualistic conscious being or rational being on the one side. And you have object that is the world of nature is standing over there, either as a hostile other or something to be overcome by the subject. So there's a conflict between subject and object in a modern European framework of thinking. And because of this problem of division between subject and object, modern European theory of subject oftentimes supplies these conceptions like super individual self or happiness of society which in instigates this the holistic approach to human existence or welfare of humankind to these conception of subject to overcome the division between subject and object but just the fact that we have to supply something more than what we have defined as a subject what as you argues that you can see that this framework is not working for us to understand the essence of human subject or its relation to the world as an object. In opposed to this modern conception of subject or a relationship between subject and object, Watsuji argues that the Chinese-Japanese conception of human beings does not subscribe to this either-or. In fact, it insinuates betweenness. And we talked about this in the last lecture that the characters that describe the term ningen consist of two characters, remember? First character insinuates a person, nin, but the character of person or single individual is already consisting of two individuals to constitute that character. So even a single individual or single person already insinuates the multiplicity or betweenness. And gen is a character of betweenness or the aida, Right? The term that Watsuji will talk about in length in this section, it insinuates the spatial-temporal betweenness. And this term shows up again and again for us to understand the nature of human being in the context of Japanese ethics. And this is the basis in which Watsuji pushed the study of ethics. Because he says ethics is the study of ningen. Now, the term ethics in Japanese is called rindi. So it's a kind of Confucian translation of the term ethics into Japanese language. This is a term both used in Japanese and Chinese. And this conception of ethics is different from modern European conception of ethics. That's what what is trying to say. And then he says the method by which we examine the nature of ethics is hermeneutics. And as I mentioned earlier, Watsuji is following Heideggerian method here. But why is hermeneutics important here? And he provides some justifications for doing hermeneutics of the conception of ethics or the term ethics rindi should be examined through the hermeneutical method. He says, we have to pay attention to the language because language in a one way is intersubjective. The fact that you speak a language already supposes there's a community of rational sentient beings that speak that language. I heard from Professor Desmond that we read the Trasemicus from the Republic in the beginning of this semester at the University of Antwerp on the theme of ethics. Now, Trasemicus' case is really interesting because he argues the opposite side, right? The opposite side in a sense that the ethics is something that you construct, right? The might makes right, 
But what is really interesting about the scene in Republic is that he's allowed by others to speak up for his, himself, and all the other ones is participating in his conversation with a different principle from the principle that he's actually advocating. If everybody thinks the might makes right, you wouldn't allow him to step in and express his mind. There's a linguistic community that is already at work in that space for somebody to say, my makes right. That intersubjective element of language is something that is already given before you actually use it as your own language. This is precisely what Watsuji is saying in this beginning of Rinrigaku. The language is intersubjective in a sense that yes, it is your words, Yes, it is your meaning that you're trying to convey to the others, but the language is not completely your own. It is already given by the network of these rational beings that constitute this communication through language. So language implies intersubjectivity, the betweenness, or what Watsuji uses the term, aidagara. To pay attention to the framework in which the term rinri is innate, is already paying attention to this intersubjective networks that allows the possibility of the conception of ethics. So that's what he's trying to imply by this hermeneutical method. What is really interesting that he insinuates the language is not just intersubjective but also transsubjective. This point is very difficult to convey, but intersubjective could be something you could say that the social self comes up with this language in such a way that it claims that it's way of expressing itself. So it has nothing to do with nature. In other words, if you hold on to the modern European conception of subject, you can still claim that intersubjectivity of language is still subjective to the community of humans in immanence or something like that. But here, Watsuji uses very interesting language to insinuate something transsubjective. That is to say, it transcends the boundary of subject to talk about the possibility that it comes from the object. I hope I'm making sense, uh, but this is what's written in the text, and perhaps it makes more sense if you read this passage. So this is page 10, the third paragraph. It says, concept ethics is expressed in Japanese by means of the word rinri. Incidentally, words are among the most marvelous things that we human beings have created. No one person has the privilege of declaring that she alone has created them. In spite of this, for everyone, words are one's own. Words are the furnace by means of which merely subjective connections made by individual human beings are converted into noematic meanings. In other words, words are concerned with the activity thereby preconscious being is turned into consciousness. Now this preconsciousness is at the same time subjective reality and as such cannot be objectified by any means. It is a cluster of practical act connections. What he's saying that through the language, preconscious being turns into conscious and there are noematic or intelligible structure comes to be. In other words, he's almost like saying that the world comes to become conscious of itself through language. So the world is communicating itself to its, itself through human communications or something like that. So it's intersubjective, but also turning this preconscious to the consciousness. There is an element of transsubjectivity in the nature of language. So hermeneutics is not just paying attention to the structure of our language and how we use them, but in Watsujian context, it seems that it suggests there's a kind of rapport between human beings as over here and the world as over there, and there's always interrelations between the two instead of having them in a separate realm. Okay, perhaps we can talk about this much more in length in class. So let's pay attention to Rin, the notion of Rin Rigaku, the first term Rin, as relations, and also what kind of between or betweenness Watsuji is talking about in the following. And these points should help us understand what Watsuji means by the term Rin Rigaku, that is to examine his conception of Japanese ethics. So Rin as relations. So Rinri, this is how you write the term ethics in Japanese. Two synographs, and the first term is Rin, and the second term is Ri. Therefore, Rinri, that's ethics. Now the term, the second term, Ri, is, he said it's an emphatic affirmation of the first term. The second character of this term, Ri, literally means something like reasonableness or rational principles. There's some ways in which we can understand the reason behind something. So it insinuates a kind of a systematic structure of reasonableness that we can actually decipher. So what's most important here to understand the notion of 
ethics in Japan is to understand the notion of Rin. What makes us ethical? The term Rin can be read in more than one way. And Watsuji talks about this notion of Nakama. So Rin can be also read as Nakama. Nakama in Japanese means the fellowship or togetherness of friends or somebody that belongs to our group or one of us. And Naka means the interrelations between individuals and Ma means betweenness. So the term Ningen, the term Gen, which was described as betweenness. So if you go back to the last lecture, you can see one of the ways in which we can read the term betweenness is Ma or Aida. So in the midst of a betweenness, you form this fellowship. That is the term Rin or Nakama, according to Watsuji. So they necessarily mean some kind of interrelations. And he gives many examples like the relationship between the Lord and, and ministers, father and son. And I'd like to pick up this notion of father and son uh, precisely in relation to the movies that we will pay attention in later. But it could also include mother and daughter, brothers and sisters, any kind of human relationship. And also this interrelations that portrays the certain structures in which we think about interrelations. Of course, he's talking about Japanese interrelations in the context of 20th century Japan. Um, let me rephrase that. Okay, what he means by the interrelations is that it's culturally specific. So the ways in which father and son interact with each other and how we define the notion of father and son in one culture is different from another. And he's merely referring to 20th century Japanese interrelations, which goes back to history of Japan and history of China. Right? So the Confucian influence of the relationship between father and son is presupposed here. But he's just describing what's going on. Does this mean that he's just giving you a description of what's going on in the society? Therefore, there's no substantial argument to say these interrelations should be observed. He seemed to say the opposite. So... He is a little bit ambivalent, but I think he points out something really interesting. To pay attention to the social structure or how we frame our relationship into father and son, or we talk about these interrelations that enable us to recognize ourselves as being father and son, or mothers and daughters, or brothers and sisters. He said there's a prescriptive nature to these interrelations. So in other words, if I interact with another human being in a certain way, we would interpret the relationship as the relationship between father and son. So if I want to become a father to a certain child, you cannot act in opposition to prescriptive norm of what counts as being father. So let's say my wife gives a birth to the child and I do nothing about him to the child. There is no relationship between father and son according to this norm by which we describe certain relations as being the relationship between father and son. So there is an element of oddness in this description of interrelations according to Watsuji. And he goes in to talk about this in the rest of this massive book. Also, there's descriptive and narrative element to this investigation. So there's the description of being of father and being of son in this study. So he says, my study of ethics or study of Rinnegaku is combination of prescriptive norm and descriptive narrative. Let's say early 20th century interrelations between father and son. That's got to be quite different from 21st century relationship between father and son, right? But there is a certain norm by which we can describe someone as being a father and, and someone as being a son. But there is a descriptive element by which we can say, yeah, this norm applies and we can describe the relationship between father and son in certain historical period, which is different from our description of the relationship between father and son. So Watsuji doesn't really say that I'm just giving you a norm, as you will see in the Kantian ethics, nor does he actually subscribe to this conception of ethics is just social mores that we can describe, or everything is actually social imagination such that we should be able to override any ethical norms, and then we should be able to do whatever we want. Machiavelli is prince, right? He's saying, I'm holding on to neither. It should have a norm, but also descriptive element is very important for understanding what counts as this oddness for describing the interrelations between single individuals in a human society. Because the notion of Ningen, according to Watsuji, implies this notion of betweenness, that is to say, it is not either oddness of being or subjective structure of thinking about what we should do and then objective reality of world as being, it's a kind of interrelations between prescriptive norm and descriptive narrative. 
So if you study Ningen, you immediately recognize this interrelations or betweenness. And then on one side, Watsuji uses this term to talk about public. This is actually Carter translation of the notion of seken or yononaka. Now, seken, the term se is the world, and ken is again the term we've been talking about. It is the between gen. So the character Aida can be read as a ken as well. The betweenness of the world is translated here as a public, or sometimes we call it yononaka. Naka literally means in the midst of something, and yo is the world, and yononaka is used to describe in the midst of the world, and that is the notion of public. Now, the translation of the term second yononaka into public is quite problematic because it insinuates this European framework in which we understand what it means to say something as being public. What we really mean by the term second or yononaka in Japanese is actually a world. When we describe the world, we use this word seken or yononaka. But if we use the word world with European modern framework of thinking about the division between subject and object, we think about this non-subjective world as world or second, right? To overcome the problem, Carter is using this term public. But just to make things easier, you have to think that this term second or yononaka is a kind of a world as it's understood in its intimate relationship with human existence. So world doesn't exist out there apart from human existence. The human exists in the world and the world is always understood in relation to humans. That intimate sense of the world is described here with the notion of a public. So on the one hand, you have this notion of object as being intimate to human existence. This is the term second or yononaka. And then you have another term describe the human existence as a single individual. That is the subject or self. Now, notion of ningen that is to say, what makes us human being is this betweenness of world and subject. The betweenness of second and self, human self. So what makes you a human being is not only the fact that you are a single individual and there is a characteristics of you being human beings, but what makes you a human being is your relationship with the world. That interrelations between second and individual is indispensable for describing any one of us as being ningen or human being. That relationship between second and individual or world and subject, Watsuji describes it as a unity of contradiction. It is open togetherness. The togetherness does not reduce one term to another. There is no equation between second and individual. There is oppositional relationship between the two, but they cannot be separated from each other. So he uses this term unity of contradiction. This term comes from Mahayana Buddhist tradition as well as Nishidian philosophy or Tanabian philosophy from the Kyoto school. So if you're interested in the metaphysics behind these interrelations between second and individual, I highly recommend you to pay attention to the Kyoto school philosophers. But within this text, let's try to understand how does this interrelations of second or the world and subject make sense? Or how does he describe this unity of contradiction? To do that, it's important to pay attention to the notion of aida or ma or gen or what we have been talking about as betweenness. Now, this notion of betweenness or aida, ma, gen or ken is dynamic between, according to Watsuji. It is not static notion of interrelations between A and B such that that form always works. That is subject to change. What makes you a father and son in each historical period is quite different from each other. But this dynamic notion of betweenness, it is not some total of natural object, according to Watsuji. So if you collect everything into a certain home, that doesn't constitute this betweenness. He says it's a social natural community. Specifically, he uses this term spatial temporal community. So it's not only the community between you and other persons in the present, but also you and some other people in the past, and maybe some of them are even dead, spatial temporal community. But he also includes nature, climate, culture, cultural understanding of the world as a climate. Uh, this is kind of problematic uh, translation, but there's huge implications of environmental ethics here in the works of Watsuji or philosophy or nature. In other words, human community is, is not existing apart from nature. There's strong intimate relationship between human existence and world existence as nature. So he talks about this betweenness as a social natural community. Okay, 
So let's think about this interrelations of world or nature and individual. He says this is a unity of contradiction or contradictory unity. So how does this between that binds these two opposing terms look like? He says it is a pure transformation. It is empty in, in and of itself. So do you remember the notion of emptiness or nothingness that we talked about in the last lecture in relation to Heart Sutra? He is precisely using that notion of emptiness. If you pay attention to the notion of betweenness in and of itself, you don't really see any substantial concept. It's just the interrelations or inter that makes that re these relations possible. So it's not something that we can conceptualize. And he also uses another word, it is absolute negation. So what binds the world and the individual is this notion of absolute negation. What does that mean? In page 22, he uses this term self-negation as the realization of totality, dialectical relationship between the world and the individual should be understood as this principle self-negation, which is the realization of totality. So this is where we can actually think about the image of the interrelations between world and individual, which makes us human existence. What binds these two terms, according to Watsuji, is a self-negation. That is to say, individual, let's say human subject, can come to be when the world negates itself and provides the room in which human existence can emerge. So giving the room for other to emerge and to be itself, giving the other its own room to determine itself, that's the self-negation. So when the individual gives the room for other to be what it is, that is the moment in which you're realizing the totality or realizing the ideal of betweenness in human existence or realizing the ideal of betweenness. So contradictory identity or dialectical relationship between world and individual or one individual to other individuals is always understood in this network of self-negation. And remember the image of Indra's net that we talk about in relation to the notion of codependent origination? A human self in and of itself as a single individual doesn't have any self-subsistent existence. What makes you a human individual is its relation to all the other things, including other individual human beings, nature and human society, etc. So emptiness in Heart Sutra is not saying that there's nothing in the world and we should all embrace nihilism. He's saying in order for you to understand who you are as a single individual, you always have to pay attention to the network of individuals, the betweenness or interrelations of all the individuals in the world. And Watsuji is doing the same here with the notion of world or totality and individual. Now, ethics is the order of the pattern through which the communal existence of human beings is rendered possible. So Rinrigoku is basically paying attention to these patterns that makes us our human existence possible. So let's say I'm single individual who is male from Japan, living in Belgium, among my friends from Belgium and from other parts of the world. What constitutes who I am is this network of interrelations with all the others. So these patterns in different historical time, different patterns are both normative and descriptive, according to Watsuji. So you have to pay attention to these patterns to understand who we are. And that's the function of the end of studying ethics. Now, it's still quite abstract. It's very difficult to imagine how the betweenness of Watsuji is working in, in human society. So what I would like to propose here is to watch Koreeda movies. And if you have a time before the actual lecture on December 7th, it's great. Uh, if you don't have a time, maybe watch it after we come out of lockdown and, and meet with your family members in Christmas. And if you can meet with your family members in Christmas, you have a time to watch this movie or maybe you watch next year. It doesn't matter. But these movies from Japan picks up few notions from Watsuji and does the whole movie. So if you pay attention to these description of human relationship in Japan that we can pick up from contemporary Japanese film, it's a great way to contextualize and see an example of how the betweenness is at work in human society. So Koreda Hirokazu, the film director of these movies, does a lot of movies on the notion of family. The Japanese term of the family is kazoku. So he does a lot of movies about kazoku in Japan. In 2004, he did this famous movie called Nobody Knows. It's about the group of children abandoned by a mother, single mother abandoned her ch children, and children try to live in the city of Tokyo. 
It's a great movie. I highly recommend. I wish was made in 2011. It's about the two boys separated from each other thanks to the separation of their parents. And like father, like son, made in 2013. This is the movie I'd like you to watch. This is about the story of two couples. Each couple has a boy from the same hospital, but the hospital made a mistake and swept the baby and they raised their child as if they were own for five years. And then they struggle with this notion of what counts as a father, what counts as a son. So you can see how this is a prime example of the interrelations between father and son from What's the Year in Ethics, right? In 2015, he made this beautiful movie, Our Little Sister. And then 2018, he made this most famous movie called Shoplifters. And if you don't have a time to watch both films, I highly recommend you to watch Shoplifters. It's something that everybody should watch. But if you have a time, you should watch both of them. And again, Like Father, Like Son is a prime example of how we would think about the notion of interrelations, specifically in relation to the example of father and son and what's the general ethics. Okay. So in the following, I would like to pay attention to the ways in which Koreeda describes the limit of the formation of kazoku. In other words, how does the interrelations between one person and another inside the family comes to be? How does the betweenness of family takes place in human society? First, there is a conflict between selfishness and selflessness. So the notion of compassion, for instance, Carter talked about as a foundation of Japanese ethics and how it's in its conflict with our inherent nature to be selfish or self-centered is played out in his movies. Second, he uses this notion of kizna or kind of bond that binds the relationship between family members with this notion of kizna in Japanese and that plays out an important role for understanding interrelations of individual beings in Japanese ethics. So, selfish and selflessness, the conflict of ningen. Koreeda described this sort of a betweenness, not only in relation to the world in a human subject, but within the human subject, there's a conflict between itself as trying to become full of itself and self as being trying to empty itself. So there's a foundation of family relationship as a selfless care of the other. It is a kind of self-negation, self-emptying that serves for the good of the other. That is always in the background of binding one member to another in family. But there's also inherent weakness in human existence. There's undeniable self-centeredness that manifests in each individual beings in this family movies. There's a need for indispensable, irreplaceable connection. In other words, one individual being is emptying itself so that all the other individual beings in the family become full, right? So there's other determination through self-negation. But sometimes that movement is tainted with this need to have an indispensable, irreplaceable connections. So the reason why you're being good to the other person is to have this indispensable, irreplaceable, and conditional connection between yourself and other ones. So you want it to be somebody that is important to the other person. That's why you are making this self-negation. But There's a contradiction in that sense of self-negating and self-emptying on one side and self-determining and self-affirming on the other side. Also, human existence is timed. So this element of death comes into the human relationship. So what binds family is not only this negotiation between selfishness and selflessness, but there is element of death. So some family members die and then their bond grows stronger or weaker. Also, there is a kind of oneness to this togetherness. We are here as a family member, but this happens only once in our lives. Right? There's something that finite, something that is contingent to the circumstances, regardless of the fact that we want to say this family relationship is important for eternity. Something really epic is happening in this family, right? But that togetherness is actually timed and it only happens once in the history. That's the conflict that we go through as a family members. Now, in these films, especially like Father Like Son and Shoplifters, you see this unspokable foundation of compassion. There's an inaudible thanks that binds all these individuals, regardless of their tendency to become self-centered. This is something that Carter talked about as a foundation of Japanese ethics, this compassion or self-negation that binds one individual and another, or our capacity to become aware of the betweenness that is our work in our interrelations with each other. There's a primal ground of hospitality and trust in these individuals, so regardless of the fact that there's conflict and hostility and a mistrust among the members, this overarching or primal ground of hospitality, 
There's a trust before mistrust that binds these family members. And also, suffering of each individual and family members are treated with equality. So one person is going through a difficult time in her own way, another person is going through his difficult time in his own way. Even though they don't necessarily look the same, the quality of suffering is taken equally. And again, there's grounding compassion forgiveness, regardless of the hostility and mistrust that takes place in these individuals. To bind them to this kind of family relations. Now, the movie challenges this notion of family because all characters in these movies are testing the limit of familial belonging. So, like father, like son, talks about relationship between father and child. They thought they were biologically related in the beginning, but then after five years, they realized they're not blood related. And then shoplifters is a clear reference to the family members that are actually not family. They just happen to be with each other, taking advantage of each other to live in one house. They pretend to be a family, right? But what binds them, Koreeda describes as this notion of kizna, betweenness, in his own interpretation. So what is this betweenness? It's a sharing of the suffering. So one individual is sharing the suffering, but it's not like sharing a sense of like inflicting pains to each other. It's about the remembering of a suffering for and with each other as a sentient beings. So you suffer from something, you share that memory with the other person, and the other person will remember it for you. So sometimes, right, you have a horrible experience in your life, and then afterwards you just say, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, right? But then a friend of yours or family members of yours come in, and you know what? I tell you that when you went through it, you're going through a horrible time. So there's a kind of collective memory that binds individual into a family unit. Also, the power of the ordinary. Koreeda describes typical image of the ordinary day, like going to the sea, could actually bind individual members into a family unit. Perhaps it's almost like going to a Knoke or Ostende in Belgium, right? Like Ostende and Knoke are not the most beautiful beach in the world. If you had a chance to go any beaches in the world, you wouldn't pick them as the primal position. But there's something really important about going to Knoke and Ostende for family members in Belgium. It kind of binds them into this family unit. It's ordinary experience of going to the sea, which is not necessarily beautiful, but that experience of jumping over the waves and all these activities can bind the single individual into a unit. Also, taking a bath together happens all the time in the Koreeda movies. So you see a kind of baptism of family members. It's routines, and I guess this practice is much more common to the Japanese than to Europeans. But this experience of communal bathing also forms this stronger bond between single individuals. Also going through the four seasons, I mentioned this in the first lecture where the Japanese sensitivity toward the nature, also seasonal changes, is both spatial and temporal. When cherry blossoms is blooming in a tree and then it turns into the green forest and then turns into this colored forest and then turns into the silver forest, right? These seasonal changes provides this sense of togetherness that forms human relations as much as human relation to nature. What is most important in these movies, especially in the shoplifters, is calling names. So you're calling your mom, mom, calling your father, father, right? Hey, dad, what's going on? Hey, mom, what's going on? That is strong enough to bind relations. Especially in relation to the shoplifters, there's a powerful scene that actually challenges this notion of calling names as the basis of binding individual into a family unit. So I would like you to pay attention to that and highly recommend you to watch that movie. So family in the history of philosophy, history of European philosophy, plays an important role. For instance, in history of metaphysics, you see Hegel talking about family as this immediate togetherness of single individuals, which is saturated with the interest of individuals or selfish interest, such that they needs to be superseded to the civil society where we bind each other into the contractual relationship and further needs to be sublated to the state. So the significance of family is always tertiary to the significance of state in Hegel, for instance. And as a response to the German idealism or this Hegelian dialectical thinking, existential tradition responded with this resistance of the singular. So Kierkegaard talk about the singular in relation to the notion of the religious, Nietzsche talks about the singular in relation to the aesthetical. But what's really interesting about this is that 
The response to the German idealism is this singular model to combat this rationalistic hall of the universal. So what's happening here is the typical question of either or. So you have either state or singular, either universal whole or particular individuality. Watsujian ethics is a response to these two extremes. He wants to say it is neither or. It is neither state nor the individual. It is the family. That's where the betweenness takes place. It's precisely the place that we should pay attention to as a foundation of human beings as ethical being. So what is the foundation of family? And how does the Watsujian concept plays a role in our understanding of family unit? So what makes us a kazuku or family unit? Koreda movies challenge the limit of the familial belonging. One movie talks about fathers whose sons are not biologically related, and the other movie talks about family that is actually not a real family. But Koreda described the sharing of the suffering is enough to create this bond between single individuals, and we talked about this notion of kizu, the scar, and naming of the scar or kizuna, uh, that is the bond in Japanese language. And also through death of members, family members, these individuals become closer to each other. So when you experience death with someone else, that someone else becomes more than just friend. Right? There's a kind of togetherness that goes beyond friendship into something much more intimate and private uh, in that regard. Also in Japanese ethics, we have this conception of ketsen and chien, or conflict between these two terms. Ketsen is the blood relation, and Qian is a land relation or this community relations. And it seems to suggest that in these movies we have a swing between the two, right? On the one side, we want to have this objective biological connection to your family members to make sure that you're actually blood related, right? So are you biologically related to your family members? Playing an important role in deciphering who is a father and mother. And then there's a sense of relationship that is cultivated through sharing the space, living go through the life, and living in the same land, right? So there's a two notions that swing between biological or scientific blood relation on the one hand, and then you have this communal, ethical, spatial relationship that defines us to become a family. Now the power of ordinary as something extraordinary in a sense that by spending time together and doing these routines, something amazing could happen to human relations, and that is the family. So let's take a look at the passage from Watsuji that actually helps us understand or the conclusion to the question of what makes us family or what constitutes the betweenness of family members. This is a passage from volume 10, page 363, and I believe this is not included in a partial translation of Watsuji Ninrigaku that you have in your hand. But let's take a look at this passage. Watsuji says, The sexual relation constitutes the union based on the love between individuals, and because of that, we cannot think of the father-son relation as based on the blood relations. In other words, he says, you can't think about relationship between father and son merely through the blood relation. So biological connection between person A and person B doesn't constitute this relationship between father and son. Why? He says, because it is a family based on the couple. A child comes into the household run by the couple thanks to a mysterious cause. In other words, the birth of a child is always contingent. It's something that happens to us. And taking care of that child becomes the task of the couple and they become mother and a father. So what makes an individual mother or father is the fact that they actually took care of the child. What determines the parent-child relation is life as a syndiasmian family and not blood relation. This is something that you saw in your reading assignment. This is page 11 of Watsuji's Rinrigaku. This is the first paragraph. Sixth line from the top starts with the now. Now it is not the case that father and son first all exist separately and then come to relate to each other in this way later on. In other words, you don't have a father and son as it is the case in biology, right? You identify individual as being father and child. But he said that's not the case, but rather only through this relationship does the father obtain his qualification as a father and the son his qualification as a son. In other words, only by virtue of the fact that they constitute one fellowship, one betweenness, do they become respectfully father and son. So what makes us human being is these interactions that enable us to be a certain type of human individuals like father, son, mother, daughter, brothers and sisters. 
And that interaction is a key to understanding human existence as Ningen, according to Watsuji. So giving birth to the third party is not just a production of the life, but also procreation. It's a creative activity and also the self-aware experience or the fact that we pay attention to our experience or interrelations is the basis of the blood relation. So when we identify somebody as blood related, it's always secondary to this interaction between individuals. Finally, a community of intersubjective existence is the foundation in which we can define the existence of a single individual. That's the conclusion we can draw from reading Watsuji, also by applying his example to life, and then we can find these life examples in a movies like Kore the movies. So what makes us family is the fact that we actually spend time together. We go through the ordinary emotion of life, and that is strong enough for us to be able to see these characters as real family. Or oh, is it? That's a really good question to ask when you watch this movie. Finally, concluding questions. Ethics today. And hopefully some of them will make it to the exam questions for the students at the uh, University of Antwerp. Here are some questions. To what extent Watsujian ethics is relevant to us in Europe? Fine, we have seen how the language of Rinrigaku works in the context of Japanese ethics and how he portrayed these interrelations as the basis of our existence as human beings or Ningen. But to what extent can we use these framework to understand our existence in Europe? Do you think it's anachronistic or culturally insensitive to apply one framework to another? Or do you think the ways in which Watsuji is dealing with these ethical questions are insightful for us to think about our existence in Europe? Second, is Watsuji right about our self-understanding as an ethical subject in Europe? In other words, he provided a framework in which we can see ourselves as devoid of self-subsistence. So he's saying that it doesn't make sense for us to pay attention to our existence as a single individual per se, right? We always have to understand ourselves in relation to other beings, including nature. But do you think this way of thinking about the self is not appropriate for us to understand the ethical subject in the context of European intellectual tradition? Or do you think intellectual tradition of Europe has come to a limit and then we have to incorporate these different cultural perspectives to go on? Good question, right? Finally, this is the simple questions, but hopefully Professor Desmond will use this as exam questions. Do you think life is ultimately empty? And if you think so, what do you mean by being empty? If you don't think so, why do you disagree with this notion of emptiness that East Asian philosophical tradition has used to describe human existence? Okay, on that note, I'd like to finish this lecture on Japanese ethics. Thanks for watching this video till the end. And I'm looking forward to our future discussions and see you next time.